have been searching. Welcome to Following the Fire. Thanks for joining us on this journey through the wilderness. Just like Israel followed the pillar of fire and smoke, we want to take a new look at our beliefs and just follow him. And like Israel, we get it wrong a lot, we get lost a lot, but we're doing our best to to go where God leads us. I'm Nathan. And I'm Steve. Don't you know it's all I have? Welcome back to the Following the Fire Book Club. You know, we're always honored and excited to have authors with us of the great books we read together. And today we have Laura Berenger, co-author of A Church Called Tove. We had a fabulous conversation with her and learned so much. And if you haven't read the book yet, don't worry. Nathan gives a great summary before we get into the discussion. But do be sure to grab a copy for yourself and a friend, or two or three. As always, the link to buy the book is in the show notes. So let's get started. I had been screaming All these messages I thought you wanted to hear But it only takes a whisper All right, today we're going to be discussing A Church Called Tove by Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger. Churches are filled with members, they have processes, leaders, traditions, and they will always develop some kind of a culture, collective ideals, priorities, ways of relating to each other and their communities. Often the culture can become its own self-sustaining force, which eventually can influence individual priorities and behavior for better or for worse. Uh, This book begins and ends by acknowledging those who have been hurt by churches, It's compassionately written to church members and leaders to help identify when their institutions have developed toxic culture and what to do to start working on becoming Tove, Tove Churches. Tove, T-O-V, is not a word I'm familiar with, but I'm going to keep using it like I know what it means for just a little longer. (laughs) Uh, Toxic and Tove Churches have cultures that impact how their leadership and members react to all kinds of circumstances. Um, but especially allegations of abuse. Laura and Scott draw from their personal experience attending a church as allegations of abuse started to go public. Uh, They also draw from stories from other churches, and the principles in this book are relevant to churches, big and small, whether they're going through something like this or not. The discussion of toxic churches in part one of this book felt like therapy to me. Mm. I was validated in, validated in my own feelings that have come from leaving or watching others leave churches. Um, this book, like a Tove church, is a safe space for the wounded. But the real magic comes next. Part two takes up the majority of the book and focuses on an idea called the circle of Tove and talks about how to instill a Tove culture in a church in priorities and behaviors that that build on each other and can kind of cyclically reinforce each other so that a church can start to have that kind of a a culture. So what part two explores is how churches can collectively nurture things like empathy, grace, truth, justice, service, and ultimately Christ-likeness. I would barely call myself someone who has been spiritually abused, and yet I still wept over passages in this book. Mm. Especially, it was especially healing to read the litany of confession. I followed the advice in this book and wrote my own. And then it was just healing to imagine the kind of churches who would have the courage to join in honest and humble reflection and this kind of communal confession. I highly recommend this book to church elders and leaders, preachers and pastors, or really anyone considering going into ministry. And I'll say it again, if you're an elder or a preacher, please, please, please buy and read this book. Um, But it's not only for them. I would also recommend this to seekers and those who are maybe like me right now looking for a church home. This book is full of the spirit, full of empathy, compassion, wisdom, and love. And still I was left wondering, if a church loses its toviness, how can it be made tovey again? (laughs) Laura, thank you so much for this book. Uh, it's something we I need to do badly, but I feel like we need badly. I feel 
a lot of the hurt expressed in, in these pages and mourn with those people who have felt that toxic side of church. And I, yet I was given so much hope from mm. this book as well. So thank you, uh, Laura, for this book. Thank you. That was really beautiful. That meant a lot. Um, I'm so grateful to be with both of you, Nathan and Steve. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a blessing and an honor to be with you. Oh, right back at you. We're, we're excited to have you on the, on the show. I'll, I'll echo everything that Nathan said as well. And, uh, uh, but before we get started, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your background and how you came to be writing this book? Yeah, it's still comical to me that I'm sitting here doing interviews like this because this is not my background. It's not anything I ever imagined that I would be doing. I'm a teacher. I'm a primary grades teacher. I've spent 20 years teaching first and second graders and even kindergartners. So my day job is really, really different than this. But yeah. when the story about Willow Creek broke here in Chicago, there was an article that um, came out. It was March 23rd, 2018. It's sort of one of those moments where I'll never forget where I was at the time. And the article came out and the headline was about allegations of sexual misconduct against Bill Hybels which was a church that I had attended for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I started reading the article out loud to my husband. And we were both, we sat there stunned because, well, initially we just kind of rolled our eyes and thought, okay, whatever. But started reading it and knew the names of the women. Mm -hmm. And it was really disorienting because we knew these were these were not like crazy women as the church was portraying them. They, they were honorable women character. They, they would have no reason to collude as the church was accusing them of doing. And so I think disorienting is a good word for it is it felt like we would go back and forth where the church would say one thing, the women would say another and I remember the moment when I, I was sitting on my living room couch and I felt just, it was a horrific feeling because I thought only one side could be telling the truth. And mm. if the women are telling the truth and the church is lying, I, like I couldn't even wrap my mind around that a church would do that. And my gut had been all along that the women were the ones telling the truth. So that's really how my journey started. It really, it launched, um, it launched a path that I never envisioned myself taking. That had to have been hard. It was really hard. Um, for me, I had never experienced a church be accused of accusations before. I suppose I had heard it out there, but when it was, and again, I had left Willow by the time the stories came out, but not, I hadn't been gone very long. I knew the names of everybody in the article and I just didn't, I was naive at the time to think that a church would behave the way that Willow Creek was, was behaving. A lot of conversations were had between my family. My mom is a psychologist. My dad is a theologian and my dad said from that very first night, this is true. There, there's multiple women saying the same thing. I just, he said, I just hope Willow Creek becomes more compassionate in their response. And unfortunately, that's not what happened. They dug in. It got really ugly. And yeah, hard is a good word for it. It was like I said, the best word I can use is disorienting. It felt like it's like it's up, upside down, sort of. Because yeah. the church, the church is supposed to be the one that's like solid and and you know giving you the truth, right? Right. And they were intentionally creating narratives and spinning the story and hurting the women even further. And I just I couldn't wrap my head around that a church, one that I knew and loved, and leadership that I knew and loved would do that. It was hard. It was, I wouldn't say my faith was shaken. I just felt what really launched the journey for me is that I felt it was not right. And that there was a much better way, the way of Jesus and what we were seeing was not it. In the 
man, in the in some of your discussions, and you mentioned your your mom's expertise. You know what what are some answers that you came up to for like, like why why would a church react this way? How how does a church kind of you know the church is full of good intentioned people that are trying to to do good. How how does this kind of a thing happen? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. My dad taught me that this is a predictable pattern and you can tell a lot about a church and who they are and what their character is when an allegation is made against them. And he had seen it. He's like, I'm, you know, sadly, I've seen this hundreds of times. What is Mm. happening is predictable. I kind of liken it to human sin, you know, when we when we feel shame about something that we've done and we want to hide and our initial reaction might be to cover it up or shame and hide and go undercover and defend ourselves and go into denial about something that we've done. And I saw the church, I saw Willow Creek the same way. I, I saw an institution and other churches doing the same is, it's hard to admit that you're wrong, that you've sinned and your entire, you know, for a pastor, your career could come um, tumbling down and be ruined. So um, that's kind of, I don't, I mean, I don't know the answer, but I've likened it a lot to just wanting to hide and not admit the truth Mm -hmm. is sometimes easier. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And you talk a lot about how, I mean, th- these cultures of um, of Tove or, or toxic cultures, how they can they can even kind of be outside of the individuals. Mm-hmm. And you you have a lot of advice on, you know, how to start to spot what culture are, are you in right now? Maybe before, hopefully, before something actually happens, there's some a- accusation. Mm-hmm. Um, could you describe to us kind of what Maybe could you tell us what what Tov means, what it, and what it means for you, and and what yeah. some. Uh... So Tov, and keep in mind, I'm no theologian. I'm a I'm a grade school teacher, but I've learned from my dad, who is a theologian, that and he's Tov, he's your co-author, right? Just for people yeah, who don't know, yeah, yeah, he is my co-author. He it is the Hebrew word for goodness, and it is a master moral category in the Bible. It appears. I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to say a number, but a lot of times in the Bible, sometimes my dad will even say the Bible is the book of Tov. And yeah, in Genesis yeah. alone, you see the word Tov over and over that God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, it's Tov. And um, a funny story, we had to really fight to get the get the word on the cover and the title of the book. <laughs> um, the publisher was like, uh... We've never put a Hebrew word on the front of cover of a book before. And they were afraid that it sounded too much like a man called Ove. I don't know if you've read that book. That's right. Yeah. It, it could, could definitely be yeah. like a dog called George, you know? Right. And it's well, like, who's, and my, oh, who's this George? Right. My um, Another funny story is the publisher said, we're concerned it sounds a little too much like a man called Ove which is not even pronounced like man ova or something in Swedish. Uh-huh. And it's a New York times bestseller. And I couldn't get to the <laughs> computer fast enough. And my dad, my dad was like, trust me, this is a good title. And nobody's ever heard of a man called. O. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they have. It is a New York times bestseller. So we still kind of joke about that. Um, the other thing he had found and it happened to me. So I, I agree with him is, he would start using the word Tov in class with his seminary students, and he noticed how catchy it was that before long they were saying, all of them were like, that's Tov, this is Tov. <laughs> and it just, it really caught on as, um, yeah, like an excitement among his students. And that's just, yeah, that's kind of where it all came from. But we describe Tov as a master moral category in the Bible. And the Bible mm. is the book of Tov. We call it the good book, right? Right. Yeah. And I think the title is great because, I mean, if, if you're in, into church anything and you're looking at books, you see church called what? Well, it makes me want to figure that out what that means. So. <laughs> yeah. 
Well they were done. afraid that it would be the opposite. Like, eh, but yeah, we convinced them. <laughs> so what does what does a a to, like the opposite of tove? You kind of compare and contrast a bit in the in the book. Mm -hmm. What can you describe what a toxic culture looks like and, and how to how to spot that? Yeah, well, what we had what we had started seeing and I don't mean to sound like I'm picking on Willow Creek, but this is my story. This is my experience. Absolutely. And it has been a pattern that we've observed and seen in other churches. But what we had seen was typically sometimes there's a narcissistic leader the culture is one of fear, um, fear and loyalty. There is an inclination to put the institution and the reputation above people at the cost of, um, at the cost of people. I'll leave it at that. Another toxic trait that we were really disturbed about with Willow Creek is then rather than just telling the truth, we saw a lot of spinning the story and resisting false or um, creating false narratives that would spin it just a little bit to make mm. themselves look good. And so we, what we really feel like with a Tove church is that it's a culture of truth telling. We also talk a lot about justice because again, what we saw too often and continue to see in some of my research and writing is um, people become loyal to the leader. So rather mm. than having experiencing justice, the toxicity lends itself more towards choosing loyalty. Um, we talk a lot about resisting the celebrity culture, resisting the leadership culture, and focusing on service and ultimately being Christ-like, tends away from toxicity and towards Tov. Something I, I feel like I've noticed is from my own hurt or when I when I hear of a story, I tend to cast the 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 toxic place as kind of villains that were scheming. Mm. But I think often these are buildings full of people who are trying to choose something good. They're maybe looking at the mission and protecting that mission or they're um they're kind of reacting but but not out of, you know, they're not Disney villains or anything. What we found too is that people are not all evil. That these were a lot of good people that made some some bad really bad choices. They were good people that made bad choices that lent itself towards toxicity. Some of them I don't even know if they even knew or understood what was happening. Right. Yeah. That I feel yeah. like that's key that I think you can, there's maybe places that accidentally end up with just a empathetic, compassionate, loving culture. But mm -hmm. I think most of the time it takes intention mm -hmm. and that it's, it's more of a lack of it, that intention that the priorities start to shift kind of under you, you know? And right. I, I've wondered thinking back because again, in my own stories, but if you had this book while you were attending Willow Creek before the allegations had come out, do you think you would have seen the signs or would, or, or would you have been able to uh, mm -hmm. kind of while you were in it? That's a great question. And to be honest with you, I did not see the toxicity until I was out. I did not recognize the celebrity culture and I participated in it. I stood up and clapped with everybody else for anybody that walked on stage. And I treated Bill Hybels like a celebrity. When I walked, when he walked by me in the lobby, I literally freaked out. Like I was in the midst of a Hollywood celebrity, <laughs> you know, like, and I just thought that that's how it was. It, it really was not until I left and started attending a little Anglican church that was so opposite and had no celebrity culture that I was really able to see it. So I, you know, maybe if I had a resource like a church called Tove at the time, maybe I would have been more inclined to see what was happening. But, you know, I'll be honest and say, I did not see it when it was there. I, there, I did feel at one point, I thought, you know, this probably isn't the healthiest feeling important the closer I got to the Hybels family, 
And I remember sure. thinking like, okay, what is going on inside me that I feel so cool that, you know, like mm. the closer I got, I knew some of the family members and I truly liked them as people. They were, fr- they were genuine friends. Um, but that probably should have been like a check in my spirit. Like, you know, what's going on in me? Why? And why is this system set up that there is an inner circle and you feel more important the closer you get to it? And then being out of it made me real, made, I was able to see it better when I was out. Yeah, I, I, I would assume that that's pretty common because when you're, when you're in a church, you, like, well, like I said earlier, you assume that the folks in charge and leadership, they're doing the best thing they can do and that they'll have good motives and that nobody's like a, a scary narcissist. <laughs> right. You know? Right. And, yeah. and so, and I, I've noticed that myself, you know, we, recently leaving the church that I'd gone to, I'm seeing things that I didn't see before mm. that how we're always there, but. And people said, this is here. And I'm like, nah, it's not. <laughs> and yeah. uh, nothing is as serious as what you were dealing with it at Willow Creek. But I think that's and, such, I think that's such an important part of the story because um, it's, again, it's, it's not the, the villain or the, or the, the hero. I, it's something that's difficult to mm. notice. Your own culture is maybe one of the hardest things to, to notice which is mm-hmm. why this book is so valuable and, and why it's important for churches who don't think they have a problem yeah. to, to invest in, in intentionally thinking about wh- where's their culture going. And I think people, don't, at least I didn't, realize how psychologically powerful a culture is, that it really can influence the people in it it tells them how to think, how to act, how to behave, how to react to problems. Mm -hmm. And we, you just can't underestimate the power that it has over you. I felt that when I, I started to get pounded when I went public about how I felt about how Willow Creek was handling the act, the allegations. And I I couldn't say everything that I knew, but I knew the women and I had talked to some who hadn't come forward yet. And I knew the church was lying, but wow, when you criticize an institution, it, it doubles back down and protects yourself, protects itself. And looking back on it now, I do wonder if it was the psychological power of the culture influencing the people to protect their church. Hmm. Right. I th- there's this this quote that just hit me in the stomach. I think it's Rachel uh, Rachel De Hollander. Den Hollander, yeah. Den Hollander. Um, oh, that's Dutch. She's a hero. Um, she 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 kind of wonders out loud, and as I think it was Christianity Today, if saying church is one of the least safe places to um, acknowledge abuse or go for help, and mm. talking about how hard it is to to see a toxic culture when you start to talk about someone who is speaking up, um, that is no longer the case. It, it becomes, um, kind of di- a directed, you know, laser beam. Um, can you tell us a little, a bit about wounded, uh, wounded resistors? So you, the book is dedicated to the wounded resistors. And then in the acknowledgements, uh, again, you, you, you acknowledge those those people. So, can you tell us a little bit about th- those people? Yeah, I mean, they are they are why we wrote the book. Um, we found over and again so many. I call them heroes. They are the people who stood up and who did what was right, and they spoke truth to power. And it was really hard. And they were wounded in the process. It's not easy to be a whistleblower over and over and over again. We've heard stories from the whistleblowers, the people who told the truth. And rather than being believed or some of them naively went to the church and thought they were doing what was right. They went to the elders. They went to human resources, thought they were doing what was right Mm -hmm. and were buried in the process by an institution protecting itself. And 
we those are those are what we call the resistors and they are over and again seem to be wounded in the process. We have been surprised. My dad and I argue about who created the term wounded resistor. I'm sure it's me. He's sure. <laughs> um, I'm sure it's you. <laughs> we are on your side, Laura. <laughs> but um, we we have been touched and surprised by how many people have written to us about that term um, that mm. they open the book and see the dedication for the wounded resistors and and they start weeping and it's really touched. It's really, for me, it's touched at the heart of where I found God to be that he's with those people that are trying to tell the truth. And it's really hard and it's not right when an institution buries it and turns itself around and harms people that are trying to do what's right. Hmm. That that reminds me. There, there's this. There's so many passages underlined in this book, uh, which means <laughs> they're impactful. But I, I have read the Sermon on the Mount many, many, many times in my life, and you put this in the context of Jesus being someone who sees the the abused basically and mm. has compassion for them, and then this list of blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are mourned because they'll be comforted, blessed humble who hunger and thirst for justice you know it goes on Mm -hmm. and and i just see the kind of the spirit of those people who they're often the individual you know one out of a church of 300 or 20 out of a church of 10,000 right um and so they're they're kind of alone yep at least in at at first until they find each other and just the heart of jesus that you kind of point out Mm -hmm. the tove teacher you know yeah, I love that passage too and it's beautiful. It it sh- you know, rather than give glory to the the powerful, Jesus had the had a heart for the wounded. And we believe that to be true today that he has a heart for people that have been wounded by churches, for women who have told the truth and raised allegations and been had a story spun against them and they've become the villain instead of the wounded is the story of Jesus and how he loved and was with the wounded and went to them is everything. That's Mm. how it should be. And that's really why we wrote the book again. I know I said it before, but we just, we felt like, with the unfolding of events of some of these churches that this is not right. This is not how it should be. And I could not handle this being the end of the story that Willow Creek wins. The women all lose their jobs. They're all depressed because the church has turned them, turned the story around against them. Um, It just, it's not right. It's not the way of God. It's not what we read in the Bible. And that's why we wrote Tove is to show hopefully that there is a better way. Yeah. There's, as, as you know, there's a lot of people like the term deconstruction is going to throw thrown around all over the place yeah. and in that, in that community. What I found is there's, there are a lot of people who have faced some sort of spiritual, mental, emotional, physical abuse. And, and it kind of kicks them into this rethinking everything phase Mm-hmm. Um, what do you have anything, any advice or, or thoughts for, for the people who are going through like that, that had that strong of a reaction to the problem, the, the, the abuse that they suffered? Well, first of all, I just want to say, I'm so sorry for the pain that people have endured from churches. It's not right. It's not how it should be. And I, I, am just sometimes overcome with sorrow for what the church has done to, to too many people. Um, and what I would say again, I know I keep repeating myself, but it's really important to me that people know that that is not of God, that what people have done is twisted and sinful, 
but God sees it. He doesn't like it. And there's hope for healing. It's not how things should be. And it's not how the story should end. Absolutely. Think of Jesus. Think of Jesus in the Bible and how he cared for people and loved people that had been hurt and were in pain. And that's what I would say. Yeah, we had a guest on recently who said, I love what she said, that um, she's not a Christian because of other Christians. She's a Christian because of Jesus Christ yeah. and what he did. And I think that's it's what well, you know. something I think that we all could keep in our, in our minds and our hearts. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's always going to be something that happens, you know. Right. Whether it's a, a family member or a church member or something, it's it's because we're people, right? Yep. Yeah. And people people hurt us, people wound us, but jo- but God doesn't. Jesus doesn't. Right. Right. So you put this Hebrew word on the cover, <laughs> and then halfway through, I'm like starting to get used to Tov, and then you throw out two more Yom Kippur. Hmm. What is Yom Kippur and how does that relate to churches today? I love that section of the book. Um, My dad actually wrote most of that, but it's probably one of my favorite parts of the whole thing. So during in the Bible, we would see Christians every year celebrate this festival where they would admit their sin and confess And it was like a historical and a personal remembrance of what they had done. And we talk in the book a little bit about like a modern day counterpart would be sort of like the season of Lent leading up to Easter. And I think the thing that that really means so much to me in the book is that Willow Creek, and again, I'm really not trying to pick on them, but it's my story, okay? <laughs> it's um, okay. They, it's like they skipped over the whole season of Lent and Yom Kippur, that they, rather than admitting the sin and confessing it and owning it and repenting and asking for forgiveness, they skipped Yom Kippur, they skipped Lent and went straight to let's hire a mediator and um, fix the relationship. Mm -hmm. And the people that were wounded were like, well, hang on a second. You know, you're skipping over a really important season of lament and owning what you did. There's a plaque in Willow Creek. Um, It's dead. It says it's like a, I don't know, like a metal plaque on the wall. And it says, this is for, this was, laid by Bill and Lynn Hybels, and it, there's the year that the church was founded. And when the whole story broke, there were some people that were like, we need to get rid of that plaque, like, just take it down, get rid of it. And I remember my dad saying, no, 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 you leave it there. And mm-hmm. every time you walk by it, you remember, and you confess, and you repent, and you own what you did. And that's wow. what, that's what Yom Kippur is, is the history of the pain of what has happened in the church is not something that should be glossed over or skimmed over, but it should be a seasonal repentance like mm. we see in the Bible. That's so that's so powerful. And it, it's it pokes a little pinprick into the our little inflated balloon of perfection or that we kind of have have all the answers. Mm-hmm. If you have to constantly acknowledge, oh wait, oh yeah, oh yeah, we don't. Yeah, and I think I think some of us evangelicals are, you know, very focused on I, you know, I'm a sinner, but Jesus forgives me, and I'm good. And we forget the importance of confession and lament and repentance. That Lent allows us to do and prepare for Easter, for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. I I think we're, you know, I like the, when I can just individually confess privately. Mm -hmm. I really don't like the individual public confession stuff. Kind of scared of that. Um, But then I think I'm even more nervous about the collective, the whole we have sinned. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, there's this story in the book of of a new pastor to a church confessing publicly, uh, acknowledging publicly 
sin that was uncovered during his time, but that was decades old. Yeah. And the, you know, I, I feel like that importance of acknowledging our, let's say the flaws in our history is really significant. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I was really struck by this section in the book where you said, it's also important to know the names and stories of heroes and especially women in our local church histories. Mm -hmm. What, what's, what's so important about that? Well, we believe that Tove churches allow the gifts of women to be used. And oftentimes, not always, but usually, it's women that are the ones that have been abused by men, by powerful men in churches. And so the idea of allowing women to use their gifts of teaching about women, exposing the congregation to women in the Bible, lends itself towards a Tove culture, where it allows everybody's voices to be heard, where women, people are put first, and that all people are celebrated and allowed to develop their gifts and use them. Have you read the making of biblical womanhood? No, yeah. but so okay. here, Laura, <laughs> I'm halfway so, through it. <laughs> oh God, it's, it's so fantastic. <laughs> I've, I've been complaining f- to everyone I know for like two weeks that I have too many books to read. I know. And then I get in the middle of your book and it says, you need to stop and buy another book and read that book. And I was like, <laughs> my books are giving me book recommendations. I know. It's so it's a well, it's in my Amazon wish list though that so because I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it because now like, yeah, your right. podcast is giving you a recommendation but yeah that <laughs> one like that book probably I read a lot I mean I read a lot and that one is the best book that I've read this year because wow. she Beth Allison Barr traces she's a historian so her angle is unique but what I learned from her is. That I will never read the Bible the same way again. I have learned the importance of context. And Mm. she goes all the way back and and traces how women in the Bible were leaders. They were teachers. They were deacons. and Maybe apostles. Right. And women in the Bible were allowed to be those things. Why are they not allowed to be those things today? It's so powerful. It's so powerful. So... Whatever we said about Tove, about women and Tove, she says it 8,000 times, like just in more detail and more powerfully. So I would, I would highly recommend that everybody read that book and allow women to be free. Yeah. I, I just realized so that the book you were, there's another book you recommend, which is in the, in Tove. Uh, extraordinary women of church history. So another, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, another resource. Um, yep. Yeah. So um, I want I want to get to talking more about like what a Tove church looks like. Mm-hmm. But first, <laughs> you you mentioned the the narcissism aspect of some of these uh, dangerous toxic leaders. Uh, I know you're not a psychologist, but your your mom is. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that makes you like half a psychologist, I guess. <laughs> I minored uh, it in in college. Oh, there, there well, there you go. go. <laughs> it's far from so it. <laughs> can you can you explain like what that means? Because I think everybody has different ideas of what that means. Can you yeah. s- just explain what that means and how how to spot that? So there's there's levels of narcissism, and you know the MMPI diagnoses like narcissistic personality disorder, and so I'm not saying that. You know, not everybody has narcissistic personality disorder, but what we have found is that a lot of these, I I don't want to pick on mega churches, but what I'm going to say is it takes a person of extraordinary character to lead and pastor a mega church and not fall temptation to the celebrity. Mm. What we see with narcissism is feelings of self-important, inflated sense of self-importance and um, very fragile ego. But what's scary about it is, for example, with Bill Hybels, 
what I saw sitting in the audience, he's on stage, was a humble person. Mm. But if you talk to people that were with him behind the curtain, you will hear about a person who always had to have his own way. He had his own garage. He had his own entry. He was separate. He he considered himself more important. He would lash mm. out at people who disagreed with him. The biggest one I would say, though, like the biggest red flag is just is a person who believes that they are more important than everybody else an exaggerated sense of importance. Like things will fall apart without them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, that, that's a word that's, that's been thrown around a lot. And I'm, I'm starting even to see again, the like collective narcissism that happens where, you know, I I think you can be in a church of 30 people and this, this happens where it's the same thing. You, You kind of either you're infatuated with your, very good leader, pastor, preacher, whoever that is, mm-hmm. or just as your kind of body, what it represents. Yeah. I mean, and there's, there's like a sense of entitlement. We found that narcissistic personalities lack empathy, that they, they have a need to be admired and they see others as inferior to themselves. And I agree. I think that it kind of trickles down to the congregation. Like, We heard at Willow Creek all the time, this is the best church in the world. And you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm at the best church in the world. Like I'm in a club. I'm this, I feel so great and important. Um, And I do think, I do think it has an impact on the other leaders, like the other, you know, the narcissist is going to surround themselves with people that, that prop them up and that doesn't help either. What they really need is somebody to tell them the truth about how they're behaving and we've gone back and forth. Is it like, was the narcissist attracted to the mega church model or did it develop over time? Did the, did the need for admiration and entitlement and let, you know, lack of empathy develop and change the person over time. It's probably somewhere in the middle. Or these, these called the toxic cultures aren't just mega churches though. Right. Yes. Sorry. I don't mean to say that all. No, I, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't playing yeah. where. <laughs> no, but what, what we did find is I'm not sure if you're familiar with Chuck DeGroat's work. He wrote When Narcissism Comes to Church. There's another book Ooh. you can add to your life. No. <laughs> all right. All right. So I'm in the list. But he says that all pastors have a tendency towards narcissism, even pastors of small churches. It's, it mm. takes something to be able to get up on the pulpit and tell people about God, like you're sort of a messenger of God. And so he warns of that in all pastors of churches, big and small. Yeah. It's something you have Mm -hmm. to, you have to be intentional about counteracting or or it's the natural. I work in tech support and our natural direction is that we're going to be rude and demeaning to our customers because they don't know what we know. That's that's what <laughs> happens if you don't do anything. It's the natural inclination of that kind of a role, mm. and I, I think every kind of job ha- has that if you if you don't realize that and put it into practice. Yeah, there's a um, I loved what you said um, about uh, reading the Bible. When you say when regular people read the Bible, they tend to identify with either the disciples or the marginalized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe when a pastor who's kind of started to see their role as kind of God's word to the church, uh, a pastor is going to read the Bible and identify with Jesus. Right. I see that collectively in in my tradition in that like our whole tradition actually reads the Bible and identifies ourselves with Jesus kind of as a whole. Mm. And then, and then we start to place maybe the world or, or people on the outside as kind of like the, those uh, people who don't quite have it figured out. Yeah. And I, I wonder, you know, it, it takes, it takes that recognition or popping that bubble. And we, I kind of want to ask your advice. Uh, so you talk some about non-accountable church structures. Mm-hmm. 
some mega churches can have that because they, you know, maybe just a really charismatic guy ended up with a lot of followers, and that's how you end up with a mega church. Mm-hmm. We come from a from the churches of Christ, okay, that are all independent, standalone congregations with no denominational structure outside of each congregation. Okay, and then a each one has a board of elders, typically. Okay, so. How can this kind of a church, there's tend to be small. How can this kind of a church make an effort to have accountability or intentionality before abuses happen so that their first response is so that they're in the light before that, that mm-hmm. first thing happens and they, they feel the need to hide. Well, first of all, having accountability there over the senior pastor We have seen over and over again some of the churches that have imploded where the senior pastor ran the show. Bill Hybels Mm. had elders, but he had veto power over all of them. Oh, wow. So really, what's the Mm. point of having the elder? And he was an elder himself. So I would say the pastor cannot be an elder, cannot have veto power over elders, needs to submit to the elder board in the Anglican tradition where I go. And there's like a whole thing going on with this now with abuse allegations coming forward. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, if we had a problem in our parish, we have a Bishop that, that could come in. There's like a high, the hierarchy. I don't know, whatever you have to say about it, there is a, a structure of accountability. So I think that that's really important that it, it, is a red flag if you have a pastor who's not accountable to anybody and a church that's not accountable to anybody. I'm not saying elders are the answer because look at what happened at Willow Creek. And same thing with Harvest is my understanding with James McDonald, yeah. that they mm-hmm. just ran over the elders. They handpicked them. Um, yeah. They were yes people. So there needs to be something in place, not only elders, but elders that are like, selected separately entirely separately from the pastor to pr- pr- to protect the congregation and to prevent some of this from happening so can you i'm i'm interested um because you 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 mentioned the church of the redeemer there's also kind of some of this the litany kind of looks like even like uh anglican to me from my uh experience with anglican churches um how how did you find a tove church what can people look for as as they're if they are looking for a church. Yeah. You know, um, we found ourselves like really struggling to get to Willow Creek and just, we're like, this is not a good place. Like we need to go to church somewhere. And so we ended up kind of by accident at this little Anglican church where my parents attended and we would visit periodically to hear my dad speak. And what I experienced, what really struck me was the Lenten season. I thought like I had never really prepared my heart for Easter the way that the Anglicans prepare. Mm. And again, it's sort of like a modern day counterpart of Yom Kippur of recognizing the darkness and the sin and, and preparation for the coming of Christ. Um, I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. There's nothing to do with the question (laughs) I can answer, but we kind of landed in a Tove church sort of by accident, but I would tell people to look for churches where you've, and it takes time. No church is going to be perfect, but I, one thing that was huge for me is having a pastor that knows my name, like with Bill Hybels, I never expected him to know my name. I mean, there was 20,000 people that would attend on a weekend. Wow. Like I never, I met him two times in 20 years it, and nor did I ever expect to meet him. He was entirely inaccessible to a regular lay person like me, but I have felt in the anglet where I go now, my pastor Jay, he knows my name. He knows what's going on. He'll, 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 jot me an email just to see, like, say, hey, I was thinking of you when I saw 
he knows I love England and when Prince mm-hmm. Philip died, you know, just it's <laughs> just like little things like that, that have meant so much to me that have felt, it has felt very tove to be known by my pastor. And he's not, he's not more important than me. He's not more important than the rest of us. After the service, he's just standing with the rest of us having coffee and talking. That would never have happened at Willow. After the service, like you couldn't get to the people on stage because they were too important. There were bodyguards or they would be behind in the green room. Um, Whereas this is like, wait a second. He's not more, Jay is a Jay Greener is not, he's not any more important than me. He's literally standing next to me asking me how my week was. And that's been very healing. And I think an indicator of a church that's Tove is a pastor that knows your name. And that, that kind of speaks to you. I mean, I'm looking at your, your diagram of your, the circle of Tove. Mm. And like the first one is n- nurture empathy. And I mean, that kind of speaks to that a little bit as far as if the leader, if the leadership like knows you and, and feels with you, yeah. Um that's going to be huge. And I was I was curious about this with the circle you, you have uh, nurture empathy, nurture grace, put people first, tell the truth, nurture justice, nurture service, and then nurture Christ likeness. I mean, it sounds like do those things and you're good, right? <laughs> I mean, is is it is that why it's a circle? Do you, do you have to keep going with it or how how's that work? Well, you know, none of us are ever going to be perfect this side of heaven. But what we believe is those that list that you just read in the circle that those characteristics will resist toxicity Mm. and they will lend itself those habits if they're nurtured over time will lead people into tove or into goodness so it's not as though they're like the answer the end all be all but it's not a checklist it's not a checklist it's a (laughs) process right right (laughs) they're habits that form over time yeah and the, I, I love that it's it starts and ends in the book with this the spirit and with maybe changing what we think of in churches about what a preacher does maybe it should focus a little bit more on prayer and you know actual pastoring i have a, a question as a as a teacher and a children's author as well yeah how can we begin to teach or model tove culture to our kids mm. Well, I'm very impacted by the work of Mr. Rogers. We wrote about him in the book. Um, he's, the he's, best. he's like my guiding light about if we raise children to know that they are loved, to love other people, to know that they are important, I believe they will grow into healthier adults who therefore love other people who love God and love other people. Um, Something that's really special about our church is that children are part of our service. They start with us and it's loud. I mean, there could be babies crying. Nobody cares. Everyone's like, oh, ha ha. You know, it's just, (laughs) it's part of it. The kids start with us and they go downstairs for a little bit for their children's service, but they come back up. And just like families did together in the New Testament, Families go forward to receive the sacrament together. They receive, they re, you know, if the parents are comfortable with the kids getting it, they receive the body and the blood and they take communion with their families. But the children from a very young age experience the lit- liturgy. They experience the pastor knowing their name and loving them and putting his hand on their head and giving them a blessing. And they're raised, they're raised in toveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. I mean, starting with our kids, because mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of this stuff is just so ingrained in us that we it, don't even see it. Right. Like the, you made the first chapter of the book. You talk about there's always a culture, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And yep. getting getting outside of that far enough to see it is important, and even better yet, having a good one from the inside. Yep. So, yeah. well, thank you so much for your time and the, your book. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to have to 
read it again. <laughs> you have any final thoughts, Nathan? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just think it was the a book that this moment needs in the American church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes me sad that this is a book we need because it does address um, some hard things in, in the body, right? That mm-hmm. that need to be addressed. But I I was thankful for the prayer at the end. That's just full of hope and a reminder that it's not just me ch- trying to follow five steps. It's, it's me waiting on God to, to mm-hmm. act. Letting the spirit transform. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just grateful for the book. I think everybody should read it, but especially the list that I gave was, is everybody leaders of <laughs> leaders or members of churches or people who are not in a church, but might be one day. That's who need, <laughs> need to read this book. Um, I love the name. Glad you called it. Tove. <laughs> Church um, called Tove. I've I've spent like two weeks calling it a book called Tove, and I can't. <laughs> that's stuck in my head. So um, a book called a church called Tove. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was really really special to be with you guys. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye. I had been screaming. All these messages I thought you wanted to hear But it only takes a whisper Hey, thanks for listening to Following the Fire. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode, which includes links to everything we mentioned as well as all the scriptures, head on over to followingthefire.com and just click on this episode. There's also contact information on the website, Let us know what you think about the show and if you have any suggestions for future topics. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts if you could. It really helps other folks find the show. And as always, thanks to the fabulous Daniel Weep for the theme song and the music for the episode. You can find more of his stuff on Apple Music and Spotify. See you later.